Hello, this is Math Jazz from Almost Cool. This is the fifth video in our series of videos on limits. Our topic today is proofs of limit laws. So in this video, I will state several limit laws one at a time and prove them. For this video, we will assume that the limit of f of x as x goes to a is l, and the limit of g of x as x goes to a is m. Uh, this will apply for the whole video, and so I won't even state them as hypotheses in the limit laws, but they'll all be understood that these limits exist and the values are L and M respectively. The first law that we'll talk about is that the limit of a constant is that constant. So the limit of C as X goes to A is C. All of these proofs start by letting epsilon be an arbitrary positive number. So epsilon can be any number so long as it's a positive number. And the way that we state that is let epsilon be greater than zero. The second step in each of these proofs is to find a delta that will work for the specific epsilon that we were given. And so um, in this limit law, it actually doesn't matter what delta I choose, so long as I pick a positive one, because that's one of the requirements on delta, is that delta must be positive uh, in the definition of limit. So I'm going to pick delta equals 1, but it doesn't matter what I pick delta to be for this particular limit law. So then we try and prove the, uh, the implication inside of the definition of limit. So we go, if 0 is less than the absolute value of x minus a is less than delta, then, and we have to prove this, the absolute value of f of x minus l is, equal, is less than epsilon. And so, well, it turns out that it didn't matter what we chose for delta. Delta doesn't affect f of x minus l because f of x is c and l is c and c minus c is 0 and since epsilon is a positive number and 0 is less than any positive number, we know that uh, the absolute value of f minus l is less than epsilon. So that proves that the limit of a constant is that constant. So the limit of c as x goes to a is c. The next one that we're going to prove is that the limit of x as x goes to a is a. And, uh, and stated more colloquially, the statement of this limit law is x goes to a as x goes to a. So this should be, this should be obvious, um, but we do need to prove that. So the first step of this proof will be we let epsilon be greater than zero. Now we have to find some delta that will work for epsilon to cause the implication in the definition of limit to be true. So this is the creative part of these proofs is to try and find some formula for delta. In this case, our delta will just be epsilon. That, that will work as our choice for delta. So then we assume that zero is less than absolute value of x minus a is less than delta. If that's the case, well, then we know that x minus a is less than epsilon because epsilon and delta are the same number. So if x minus a is less than delta, x minus a must also be less than epsilon. And that proves our, our theorem, or sorry, that proves that the limit exists because f of x was x and l was a. So the absolute value of f minus l is less than epsilon, as we desired. So this proves that the limit of x as x goes to a is a. Now, from here on out, we'll be talking about arbitrary functions f of x and g of x. The limits will exist because we already assumed that at the beginning of the video. But we won't be able to give specific formulas for delta, we'll just accept that we get some sort of delta from the limit of f existing or the limit of g existing. And then we'll manipulate that delta into a form that works for our new function. In this particular case, our function is c times f. So we want to show that 
the limit of c times f as x goes to a is just c times l, where l was the limit of f at a, and c is the constant that we're, we're given. So the first thing we do is we let epsilon be greater than 0. The second thing we do is we have to find a delta that will work in the definition of derivative. But uh, the delta that we'll get will be chosen this way. We're going to pick delta so that the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon divided by the absolute value of c whenever 0 is less than x minus a is less than delta. Now we can do this because we know that for every positive number we can find a delta so that if x minus a is less than delta then f minus l is less than the positive number we were given. Now epsilon is positive, the absolute value of c is positive, so epsilon over the absolute value of c is a positive number, which means we can find a delta that will make f minus l less than that positive number, epsilon divided by the absolute value of c. And so we pick that delta. So now we have to show why that delta satisfies the definition of limit. So we say if 0 is less than x minus a is less than delta, then, well, we have to show that our function minus our limit is less than epsilon. So our function is c f of x and our limit is c l. The absolute value of that, well, we can factor a c out of the two terms so we get that the absolute value of c f minus c l is equal to the absolute value of c times the absolute value of f minus l. But we know that f minus l is less than epsilon over absolute value of c because x minus a is less than delta and we chose delta so that f minus l would be less than epsilon over c so we get that c times f minus l is less than c times epsilon over c the c's will cancel so our function minus our limit is less than epsilon and that proves the limit so in fact we can pull constants out of limits. So the limit as x goes to a of cf is cl. Now we're going to prove that if two limits exist, that is the limit of f and the limit of g exist at a, then the limit of f plus g is just the limit of f plus the limit of g. So the limit as x goes to a of f of x plus g of x is l plus m. This will start by letting epsilon be greater than 0. We'll choose delta 1 and delta 2 so that 0 less than x minus a less than delta 1 implies f minus l is less than epsilon over 2. And 0 less than x minus a less than delta 2 implies g minus m is less than epsilon over 2. Now if we pick delta to be the smaller of delta 1 and delta 2, then 0 less than x minus a less than delta implies that the absolute value of f plus g minus l plus m is equal to the absolute value of f of x minus l plus g of x minus m which is less than or equal to absolute value of f minus l plus the absolute value of g minus m but both of those inequalities are less than epsilon over 2 so we get that f plus g minus l plus m is less than epsilon which proves that the limit is indeed l plus m we're going to prove that the limit of f times g as x goes to a is l times m We're going to prove the case where m is a positive number. Uh, it's a minor change to prove the case where m is a negative number, and uh, we we will leave that as an exercise for the the watcher, the viewer. We're going to need a full screen for this proof, so we're going to uh, remove the statement of the limit law and start with a clean screen. 
so we're going to let epsilon be greater than zero. We're going to pick delta one, delta two, and delta three such that x minus i less than delta one implies f of x minus l is less than epsilon over two times m plus one. And the reason we can choose that is m is a positive number, so a positive number plus one is a positive number, two times a positive number is a positive number, and epsilon divided by a positive number is a positive number. So we can always pick a delta so that f minus l is less than some positive number, so we can pick a delta one. We're gonna pick delta two so that g minus m is less than epsilon over two times the absolute value of l. And we're going to pick delta three so that g minus m is less than one. That is that, uh, so we, we know that g is going to be at most m plus one, or is, g is going to be less than m plus one. And that's the, the important part that we'll use from that inequality. Okay, so we're going to pick delta b to be the smallest of these three values. That means that if x minus a is less than delta, then all three of those inequalities that we stated are going to be true. Now, our function is f times g, and our alleged limit is l times m. We have to prove that f times g minus l times m is less than epsilon. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add zero inside of the absolute value. And the way we're going to write zero is negative LG plus positive LG. And you see, since the terms are the same but with different signs, it's really adding zero, so it doesn't change the value. Next, we're going to use the triangle inequality to say that fg minus lm is less than or equal to fg minus lg plus lg minus lm. We'll factor out g of x from the left side absolute value, and we're going to factor out l from the right side absolute value, so we get that this is less than or equal to m plus 1 times f minus l plus l times g minus m. That should be the absolute value of L times G minus M. And the reason that we know that when we factor out G, well, we know that G is less than M plus one. So when we factor out G, we can replace G with M plus one and, and that will keep the inequality true. Now, once we've done that, we know that epsilon, uh, sorry, we know that since X minus A is less than delta, that uh, f minus l is less than epsilon over 2 times m plus 1, and g minus m is less than epsilon over 2 times the absolute value of l, so the m plus 1s will cancel in the first fraction, and the l's will cancel in the second fraction, and we're, we get that that equals epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is epsilon. So the absolute value of f times g minus L times M is less than epsilon, which proves that, in fact, the limit is LM. For the next slide, we're going to add the hypothesis that L is not zero. We're going to prove that the limit of one over F as X goes to A is one over L. First we let epsilon be greater than zero. Then we pick epsilon one and epsilon two so that zero is less than X minus A is less than delta one implies F minus L is less than the absolute value of L over two and zero less than the absolute value of X minus A less than delta two implies that F minus L is less than L squared epsilon over two. We're gonna let delta be the larger of delta one and delta two. So X minus A less than delta implies that 
1 over f of x minus 1 over L is equal to L minus f of x over LF. We're just cross multiplying there. And we know that this is less than 2 over L squared times f minus L. And that is going to be less than 2L squared, epsilon over 2L squared. And that is going to be epsilon. So this proves that 1 over f goes to 1 over L, as L goes to A, so long as L is not 0. We're now going to prove that li the limit of f over g is L over m, so long as m is not 0. We can do this, though, by... Uh, from our previous limit law, we know that if the limit of two things being multiplied, if uh, if the limit of each of those things exists, then the limit of the two of the product exists also, and is just the product of the limits. So the way that we're going to approach this limit law is we're going to split our limit into two limits: the limit as x goes to a of f, and the limit as x goes to a of one over g of x. Well, we know that from our previous limit law that the limit of 1 over g of x is just going to be 1 over m. And we know by hypothesis that the limit of f of x is L. So each of those limits exist. So that means that the limit of f times 1 over g of x is just L times 1 over m. And so that gives us the law that we we were looking for, that the limit as x goes to a of f over g is L over m. Thank you for watching this video. Contact information is on the screen. I hope that you're enjoying learning calculus, and I hope you have a great day. Bye.